Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Codewaid, and my guest today is Katie Herzog. Uh, Katie, could you introduce yourself? I'm Katie Herzog. Um, I am the host, the co-host, the, the, I would say the number one host of the podcast Blocked and Reported uh, with Jesse Single. Uh, and I'm a former staff writer at The Stranger, Seattle's All Weekly, and I suppose those are my main identifiers. I am the also, I guess, the, the proud mother of a golden doodle who looks just like me. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for coming uh, back on, uh, back on sure. Bologna. It's a back on Culturally Determined. Um, and uh, so, so, so you and Jesse Single um, have launched this podcast. Uh, you must have launched it right after the pandemic started, more or less, right? Yeah, we launched it right after I got, I got, so I got furloughed from The Stranger at first. Um, I took a, I, the stranger, like everywhere else, was having a major crisis after the after the pandemic started because, like you know, all weeklies all over the all over the country, finances were already tight, right. and most of our revenue came from events and restaurants and pot pot shops and um, you know things that require people to be able to leave their homes. So um, my my boss was sending out sort of increasingly desperate emails about um, how we needed to do fundraisers and like how shit was going to get bad. And so I volunteered to take a furlough thinking at the time that it was a totally empty gesture. And then like four hours later, he called me and he said, um, thank you. So I took a furlough and then was this, uh, Dan this is not Dan Savage. This was Tim Keck, who was okay. the founder of the paper and also incidentally, the founder of the onion, um, which he sold for $10,000, uh, oh. pretty soon after it shorted. Yeah. Uh, started. Yeah. <laughs> not the best, not the best business move in history. Um, and then shortly after that, um, most of the entire staff got laid off. So, uh, the paper is still limping along, um, in a digital only state, but I am no longer part of it. Okay. Um, yeah. So I actually, I had, I, I did an episode with Jesse, like, like, week two of lockdown or something. And I remember he was, I think you had just been furloughed. And then <laughs> I think he was talking about, you guys were thinking of uh, putting something together. Uh, but it's, it's had a, like a, a meteoric rise, I would say uh, over the past, however, 10 or 12 weeks. Um, and you guys set up a Patreon and do, do like bonus episodes. And uh, you seem to be uh, doing very well, uh, but that's, that's not the main reason uh, we're here today. Um, <laughs> the main reason is, um, well, our, our original topic is, uh, the Harper's open letter, which you were one of the signatories of about 150 people. Um, but two of the other signatories of that letter, uh, just today, we are recording this on Tuesday, um, announced that they are leaving their positions. Uh, Actually, I don't think that, only, I think only one of them was a signatory. Oh, Sullivan wasn't a... No, which was, uh, uh, I noticed, I, I noticed that he was not. He sort of would assume that he would have been. Okay, I don't... I guess I don't I don't know what that's about, um, but he was not on the letter. Okay, that's interesting. I, I guess I, yeah, I guess I had like that's like a um, false memory I had of seeing his name on there. Okay, but the main the main person is uh, Barry Weiss, uh, controversial uh, opinion editor and writer at the New York Times, uh, resigned in a pretty um, uh, public way, uh, posting a letter, like another open letter, I guess, but addressed to uh, uh, A.G. Sulzberger, but uh, laying out her. Um, grievances and saying why she was leaving, and we can we can link to that below. And probably people know who she is. I mean, she's really um, I was joking on Twitter. She's really like a, like sort of a master of public relations and getting herself in the public eye. And I mean, how many other editors, like opinion editors, of the New York Times, does the average you know uh, reader know who it is and know what they look like and know and have some very strong opinion about them? Um, so she's she's kind of done it once again. And um, so what did what did you think when you uh, when you heard that? I was not particularly surprised that Barry resigned um, when James Bennett stepped down in the aftermath of the now infamous Tom Cotton uh, opinion piece. I thought Barry's going to be next and Brad Stevens is going to be next. And mm-hmm. I, I don't have any insider knowledge. I haven't talked to either of them about this, um, but I was not entirely surprised. I was uh, also not surprised to see Andrew is stepping down um, from his job at, at New York Media. Um, that seems pretty inevitable, especially now that, that New York Mag has been, or not New York Media, New York Mag, um, New York Mag has been bought by Vox. Right. Um, it seems like probably a, a, a cultural clash there that was not going to last. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there was a media speculation, uh, on Twitter that where people love speculating with no evidence that, you know, two prominent people leave their posts on the same day. They're going to some, new place. Um, right. And I know I have no evidence of that. They haven't announced that. Seems possible. Who knows? But um, 
you know, or, you know, in this, in this world with, with Patreon, you can really just like hang your own shingle and <laughs> do your own thing. Um, I mean, so what, what did you think of the, of the letter of the, of the, her resignation letter? I thought it was bold. I thought posting it was very bold. There was a lot of it that I recognize from my own experience working in a place where you are sort of seen as the outsider. Um, you know, the the place that Barry occupies in the media, I, I find it strange. I mean, when she tweets, when she writes, there is often a firestorm immediately. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's because of what she actually writes, lots of which is just sort of center left, maybe center right, or it's because who she is. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about this. Why Barry? You know, why is Barry the person who who is, I will say, like, I, I know Barry a little bit. We're friendly. She's extremely generous. Um, she's a mensch. And you'll hear this over and over again by people who are friends with her. Um and so it's strange that she has become the sort of villain on Twitter. When I like, I would like to know what the worst thing that Barry has done is. The worst thing she's written, and of course, worse is is a subjective term. But I'm curious about if somebody could point out like all of Barry's sins. Um, I'm guessing that they're going to seem a little bit uh, smaller than the than the the hype around her would suggest. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, her kind of ability to generate controversy in, in, in the attention economy is in some ways an asset. Um, right. You know, I mean, pe- I will say, I don't articles. think that's, yeah, I, I will say, I don't think that's entirely something that she's created or crafted herself. I, I don't think, I mean, the first, I first heard about Barry when she wrote a piece after the Aziz Ansari Me Too incident. And I'd never read her work before. And uh, she wrote a piece that was called like, I can't remember what it was called, but she, it, it was something about how there's like, it, about how this, this claim against disease on sorry was a bad date. And that piece seems to be the one that sort of set her apart from most of her particularly sort of progressive feminist colleagues at the times. Um, and it was a column that I frankly agreed with. Um, so I've always sort of liked her. I don't agree with her and everything. Uh-huh. Um, but I just, yeah, I, I'm curious about this. Why Barry? Um, Andrew, I think, makes a little bit more sense because Andrew, uh, is a little bit more controversial, genuinely more controversial than I think, than I think Barry is. Um, and I, once again, like, there's, like, she writes lots of stuff that I, that I don't totally agree with, but I also would not ever consider her a monster, which many people on Twitter and in media seem to. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, maybe there's some of the, um, what is the, what is it, is it the narcissism of small differences or, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, yeah. she, like if she presented herself as, you know, like Heather McDonald presents herself, right. Then people wouldn't be like, Oh, here's this, you know, 30 year old uh, Jewish lesbian or bisexual, bisexual woman, uh, mm-hmm. you know, who is pushing all of our buttons. They'd be like, Oh, here, here's another conservative, you know, doing the, the conservative thing. So I think that's part of it. Um, yeah. I, like I, I do. Yeah. She, she has a talent. I mean, she had a tell for making media, Twitter, and thus a lot of other parts of Twitter go insane. Um, as sometimes, I mean, I think she wrote some shitty columns. I can't, you know, her, I, what, the worst thing she wrote, I can't immediately put my finger on it. I mean, she's an ardent Zionist, and, um, yeah. and that pisses a lot of people off. Um, yeah, and, and that's that's where I disagree with her most. Um, and I also, I think that she has a hyper focus on anti-Semitism, and she might see it in places where it doesn't exist. But you could also say that about lots of people in media about whatever their particular yes, identity and, is. And there's one, when we talk in our next segment, I, there's one particular instance of that that I want to mention um, sure. about the open letter, but... But yeah, so, um, and, you know, Sullivan, um, is interesting. I mean, he's obviously been around, uh, writing in public for close to 40 years, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, he was just on Walking Head's, um, Sister Slate Media of Life mm-hmm. TV with Bob Wright, um, who, you know, and Bob knew him from when Andrew was the Wonderkin editor of, uh, the New Republic in, in the late 80s. Uh, mm-hmm. but, you know, he's had some, you know, he, he's a contrarian. He changes, he, he, he changes his beliefs very quickly. He was like a super supporter of the Iraq War, and then within like, what, a month of the invasion, he had like turned on it completely and was a crusader against the Iraq war. So he's, you know, he's like a, a, a moralist and uh, holds very strong opinions. I thought I used to be a uh, committed reader of his blog. I mean, his blog was kind of like Twitter before Twitter existed. And mm-hmm. I used to reload it, you know, five or 10 times a day to see what the latest stuff was right. because there wasn't really another way to get that. And he was really great at it. And yeah. um, I think the thing that was best was 
it was like a, it was like a magazine. It wasn't a personal blog. Uh, he, he would write something and then he would publish the readers, the reader emails calling him a moron and, re- and respond to it. And so it really was kind of like a conversation. He would just find good links, but actually, you know, it, it wasn't really him doing the entire thing. Yeah, he had staff, including Phoebe Maltzbovey was an intern, mm-hmm. uh, there, um, early in her career. So, yeah, so he was really, so he was like one of the original political bloggers and a master of the, the form. And then when he, when he stopped his blog, um, you know, he was gone for a couple years and then took up this thing at New York Magazine where he was, he would write, I think almost consist- consistently, it was always, he would write basically three long blog posts that were posted as one piece mm-hmm. and they would like appear on Friday. And I thought yeah. this did not work for his it- strengths. It's I, a weird model, the like three in one thing, just from like a usability perspective, the three in one, I like just have three different columns. Yeah, it's not, it's not optimized week. for social. And I'm right. sure he, right. I mean, he must have fought for it because I'm sure there are people in New York Magazine saying, you know, yeah. if we make this three things, then we'll get three times as many hits. Um, I mean, maybe he just wanted one deadline a week, um, which, you know, okay. I mean, as a writer, that sounds much better than three deadlines a week. Yeah. So it was almost like he was a master of the previous era of online yes. media, the blog era, and then was overtaken by this new, more hellish era, which is like right. the, tw- the social media Twitter era. Um, yeah. And, you know, this website is, is, it was invented right in the heart of the, that previous era and still in some way, in some ways like embodies some of the virtues, I hope, of, of that era. But yeah, mm-hmm. so I, I think he was ill sor- ill served by that form and I would read him sometimes, but after a while, it just, he just felt like, um, cranky uncle Andrew, you know, complaining about, the social justice warriors that he's always complaining about. And maybe he did write, maybe the third little essay was good, but why would I scroll all the way down when I have so much other shit that I could be consuming right now? So I hope, I mean, I think he's a talented guy, obviously controversial in various ways. Um, and I hope he finds some, a way that can, you know, take his talents in a better direction. I think he would write like one or two big feature pieces for the magazine per year. And those were often very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's maybe, a great writer. He's yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe his, his talent yeah. lies in like both in the, the micro and like the, macro or something, but he's not yeah. as good at the in-between or something. Um, it definitely, his talent is definitely not on social media. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, so well, Andrew and, and Perry, uh, we wish them well. If they want to come on, Culture Determined Invitation is, is extended. I actually read Barry's book, um, mm. which I think is called How to Fight Anti-Semitism, uh, that her publicist said to me anticipating that she would come on and then it kind of uh, never happened because she seemed too busy or maybe they figured out that it wouldn't be like a super friendly interview, uh, or, or something, but, but, but Barry, the, uh, you know, invitation is, is still open. Um, oh, and I guess just the other thing I want to say is, I mean, the things in her, she, the stuff that she describes in her resignation letter, there's some stuff that seems like, you know, she, like she, she should have, or she did go to human resources. And like this, this is a serious problem. Like people putting ax emojis next to her name in Slack or comparing her to a Nazi in like internal communications. Like, these are bad things, and if it, if true, seems like I am sure that they are true. I mean, do you remember when the Huffington Post someone leaked? Uh, what was it? It was someone leaked a Slack channel of, or a Slack conversation about Barry after it might have been after she made a like she made that infamous tweet about I can't remember the woman's name uh, the figure skater during the Olympics, and right. she erroneously re- referred to her as an immigrant. It's right. sort of a riff on a Hamilton line. Yes. Um, so just reading that, and that was several years ago, I imagine shit has gotten way worse for Barry. And just like, I don't know. It is it is like having talked to people like Barry and Andrew about what's in people all over the media landscape, some of whom are quite famous, but sort of aren't out as uh, as problematic, I would say, about what's going on in their workplaces. It is not at all hard for me to imagine that people are extremely nasty to Barry on Slack. It's like, they're nasty to her on Twitter. They're going to be nastier to her on Slack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it is, it, it, sounds, uh, it sounds fucked up what was happening to her in the sort of employee sense. And, but then there's also this irony that it's kind of like, like, she's the victim of bullying and, you know, the whole, like, like, I don't know if she is a, like, safe space, you know, a uh, precious snowflake type of person, like, critiquing that kind of stuff, but it is like, you know, she needed a safe space at the New York Times or something and, and, and didn't get it. And so, like, it, it seems like she was, you know, bullied in some way if people are ganging up on her in All an right, internal uh, channel. I want to say something about this. 
I think there's a big difference between, let's see, uh, the sort of safetyism that people like Jonathan Haidt talk about on campuses, um, where people are, they want to be shielded from ideas that might be challenging and direct harassment of you as a, as a person. I just, I think there's a really big difference from that. I think there's a difference between, um, between ideas, between uncomfortable political speech and somebody calling you a Nazi, a colleague calling you a Nazi, that to me crosses the line into bullying. And so from I like I can see why some people might call that hypocrisy. But I just think there's a there's a real difference between someone who who is a, you know, re- doesn't want to read Huck Finn because it uses the N word and right. somebody who is opposed to being called a Nazi by their colleagues and publicly available or searchable channels, um, internal ones or external. Um, yeah. And so it seems like, I mean, it seems like she, you know, there's like some sort of possible lawsuit that, that, it, that could be lodged here, though. I doubt that would actually happen. But, yeah, I, um, I kind of doubt that. But we'll see. Or, you know, she could have been given like a, like some kind of severance or something to, like in exchange for, for just leaving and, and like ending the, you know, ending the entire issue. Right. Um, okay. I think that's all I have on, on Barry. Okay. So you, uh, so you're one of the signatories of this letter, which was published in Harper's and the official title is a letter on justice and open debate. Um, can you talk about kind of how you came to be a signatory on this letter? Sure. Uh, it was pretty simple. I got an email from somebody. Um, it might have been Emily Yaffe, and they just sent me the, the draft of it. I agreed to sign it, and then they asked me um, how I would like to be introduced. What I actually said was that I would like to be called the host of Blocked and Reported. What they ended up putting in the letter was podcast host. So I was the only one of this like illustrious group of people who had the words fucking podcast host, um, which I really wanted to use it as a way of advertising my podcast. So that was my disappointment with the, with the, pod- with the letter is that they didn't mention the name of my show. Okay, that's funny. Yeah, I mean, um, and yeah, and then they put Jesse. So Jesse Singler, your co-host, um, was on there as well. And I think they, they like listed him as New York Magazine or something, but he's not you know, he's not officially at New York Magazine anymore. Um, I saw him tweeting about that. Okay, so yeah. when you, um, did you just read it and say, yeah, thumbs up, let's go? Or did you, did you have any, uh, did you, uh, dwell on it, it for, or meditate on it, or, or, or what? I, I did dwell on it for a little bit. And the reason I dwelled on it is because I have made it a point to sort of, uh, distance myself from any sort of movement. I'm not a letter signer. Um, I typically don't sign petitions. I mean, maybe I would if somebody like was like standing in front of my grocery store asking for a petition to like save the whales or something like that. But for the most part, I try to keep my distance from movements and from activism because after years of working in media, including in at a progressive, uh, climate change environmental site, I have and this, what I'm about to say is not a reflection of, of my coworkers or my former workplace. Um, but I, I find that activism, the act of engaging in activism of making your own identity sort of, or making activism tantamount or paramount to your own identity makes it really avar- hard to evaluate whatever you're fighting for, whatever the cause is on its merits. Um, so for that reason, I don't consider myself a feminist anymore or an environmentalist or anything like that. Um, and I think labels also are destructive and, 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 uh, make this tribalism that we're experiencing much worse. So my hesitation wasn't really about the content of the letter. It was just, do I want to be a part of something? Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately I decided that this was worth sort of suspending my, my rule. Okay. So, um, so I, probably most people have heard of it at this point. We'll include the link to it. So a number of, it was almost like it somehow seemed almost more important, like the people who signed it. In, in, in the reaction than the actual content of the letter. So a number of luminaries uh, signed it, including, you know, Katie Herzog, Jesse Single. Yes. Those, those two. So two, um, so the feminine chaos host, some blogging heads, yeah. Kat Rosefield, Phoebe Baltz, both, both signed it. Um, yes. And also John McWhorter, uh, who appears very often on the site, signed it. And then, uh, you know, Margaret Atwood signed it. Uh, Noam Chomsky signed it. Uh, Stephen Pinker. Gloria Steinem, yeah. Yeah, Gloria Steinem, um, uh, and J.K. Rowling, perhaps most, very controversially, and, and Barry Weiss signed it as well, along with people, you know, some people, I, I guess, are academics or writers I weren't, I wasn't familiar with, but there's a number of prominent names on it. And so, okay, so yeah, it kind of became like, um, I don't know, they, they, I mean, this is really sort of the, <laughs> maybe people were just tired of the whole Black Lives Matter thing and talking about it and this gave us something else to talk about and that's why it blew up so yeah. big and that's that's kind of a weird cynical thing to say but yeah. it makes sense to me well, 
it's also a media story, you know, like a, the media, I think a lot of us are at heart sort of, if, sort of narcissist. And so this sort of, this really played into this, this sort of us versus them. I think, I think some of the criticism was from people who were pissed they hadn't been invited on to sign the letter. I do think that was a part of it. And also, as you mentioned, there were these controversial figures. The fact that JK Rowling is the most controversial signing of the letter is, hilarious will never stop being funny um but i do think like even if so a lot of the coverage has focused on jk rowling and to a lesser extent jesse and to a lesser extent me although i'm not generally mentioned in these like npr pieces about it which is fine by me but because uh, jesse and i have both written things that and jk rowling have both written things that other people have called transphobic i would argue that nothing that any of us have written is actually transphobic but this thing gets repeated. Jesse Single is a transphobe. J.K. Rowling is a transphobe. Katie Herzog is a transphobe. It has just gotten repeated so often that people just believe it without doing their own research. So, so Jesse and I both often we are called this. When you ask people, okay, please point to point to the most transphobic thing I've ever written. Point to the most transphobic thing Jesse's ever written. There's no response because there's no transphobia. So. That, as a criticism, also, the letter was not about transphobia. It wasn't about trans people at all. So that was, that was annoying. That other than, that instead of looking at the content of the letter, people focused on a few of the signatories. I'm curious about what would have happened if the three of us hadn't been on the letter. Because I think there would have been a similar outcry. They just would have focused on other people. So it could have been John McWhorter. It could have been Coleman Hughes. It could have been Thomas Chatterton Williams. Um, the people who have been, been more critical of, of, um, of Black Lives Matter and of, of, of some, some facets of, of, you know, black activism. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there was always going to be some sort of firestorm. It's just that the one that sort of took hold in the narrative was transphobia. Um, this invisible transphobia that nobody can point to any evidence of it actually existing. Yes. So, yeah, I wonder if, I mean, with all due respect to you and Jesse, I, I think it's just if Rowling's name wasn't on there, it would have been somewhat different. She's, she's like maybe yeah. half a level above you in terms of, you know, international maybe, renown. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit. But, and for whatever reason has made this like her cause of the past um, month or so. Um, and so, yeah, so that, so that was strange. And then there was like, you know, how could you, like, how could this person, Noam Chomsky, the, you know, grand, great, you know, the beloved grandfather of the socialist left, or well, I don't, maybe he's a communist, I don't exactly know, of, you know, of the left, uh, sign a letter with these, like, hated, <laughs> hated, uh, despicable figures. I think that was it's all like kind of the people who say, Yeah, the people who say that, I'm like, are you familiar with, with Noam, Noam Chomsky's writings on free speech? This is, like, it just, it, it's sort of ahistorical, um, yeah, the whole thing is ridiculous. And plus the fact that most of us didn't know who the signatories were in the first place. Right. I mean, which is not, uh, they weren't trying to hide anything. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's an evolving document. Um, I think the three people who were mentioned when I, when I was approached were, um, Margaret Atwood, George Packer, and Thomas Chatterton Williams. I'm sure other people were mentioned when they approached uh, whoever else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but you can't have a list of, uh, with a, a, a document that's constantly evolving, you can't have a list of like, these are who we've approached, this is who has agreed, this is who has not. It's just, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that, um, yeah, that, uh, Packer, well, I guess it's not that interesting that Packer's on there. Um, but so, okay, so, so yeah, so I, I, I this, I don't know why exactly this, so the, my, my personal, like, you know, kind of reaction to, to uh, the letter was this is like the first thing in months that is like inspired by comedic, comedic um, uh, spark on Twitter. And so I was just riffing on this constantly and I was uh, fake outraged about not being asked to sign the letter. And that was fake outraged about not being asked to sign the reply letter. And I, I was like, I want to do an open letter so that someone can like, you know, they'll be like, get me on an open letter. Like, yeah. so I've, I've just been riffing on the whole thing. And you've just some- been outraged for a <laughs> well, week. something about outraged. Being- I don't know the the high moral dungeon kind of aspect to it that lends that I think is you know, easy to like push a pin in to to sure. pop it, but um, but I think one of the I mean so one of the criticisms that is more legitimate is that a lot of what it said was kind of like not vacuous but just like vague. Um, you know we all we all believe in open debate and probably do most, we well do that's we? A, well okay so that's a good question. Um, and then you know the um there there weren't. There weren't line by line, like, instances, denunciations. It was obvious what some things were referring to. The reply letter, like, went into, like, going after Jesse, like, with specifics or suppo- supposed specifics. Um, and, but just that, like, okay, the fact that, 
you know, people from somewhat across the ideological spectrum from the, from Noam Chomsky to, um, you know, David uh, from uh, yeah, from he, or Coleman yeah, Hughes or something. Brooks. Yeah, uh, you know that all these figures could agree to this. It was kind of like, okay, like if uh, the letter was for in support of like ice cream after school or something, well, we'll all sided. Even you know the mean kids in class want ice cream after school along with the uh, the good kids or something or something like that. So I, I think so, but but that kind of the kind of vagueness I think gave a, an opening for people to read into it these various nefarious things, and mm-hmm. so there was uh, one. Uh, woman on Twitter who tweeted a like photoshopped version of it where she added in like every line, every clause had to do with trans issues. And like right. really the entire thing was like a dog whistle about, about trans issues. And then- there's, there's so many dogs, like how are dogs not all deaf right now? There's appa- so, apparently so many dog whistles going on. I, you know, I read it to my dog and my dog didn't do anything. <laughs> my dog just looked at me. And then um, the, uh, the uh, I, I don't know, how would you describe it? Uh, Max Blumenthal, you know, who's, who's kind of a left-wing uh, critic of American foreign policy, was talking about how, you know, uh, so many people in the, in the letter were uh, Zionists or, you know, conservatives, supporters of the American war effort and, uh, including people who tried to, uh, and I think he, his exact quote was cancel certain countries because like they supported the Iraq war or, or right. something like that. Whereas Blumenthal was an anti-Zionist actually does want to cancel a specific country, the country of Israel. No one right. seemed to, uh, <laughs> pick up on right. that besides me. But, um, but yeah, so, so there's, okay. Do you think there's, do you think like the, the woman who tweeted this, who as far as I know is trans, uh, who, who saw like the entire thing as an anti-trans statement, do you think she's acting in good faith and that she actually does think this or, or she's like just using it for her own purposes. I don't know. I don't know her personally and I'm, I'm not in her head. I try to believe I, for as a general rule, I believe that people say what they mean. I mean, they might be lying. They might be full of shit. I mean, clearly it's also opportunistic. Um, but she, cert- she probably believes it. I mean, she probably believes that JK Rowling and Jesse and I are genuinely transphobic and she is wrong about that. But I'm sure there is also nothing I could say or nothing she could read of our own work that would change her mind. Um, okay. Why? So is it, is it just that, you know, people who are in the fight for trans rights see a threat to trans rights everywhere? Is that part of it? Or is it your, the names of you, Jesse and JK Rowling? Or, or what? Or is this idea that like, oh, somehow we need like open debate or something is, uh, that is a threat to the trans rights movement? Do you understand this at all? I don't understand it at all because it, it, it comes from a false premise, which is that JK Rowling, Jesse, and I are all transphobic. So I don't like, if we hadn't been on the list, I don't think that transphobia, I don't think people would have read these dog whistles for a letter that also the three of us were not involved in crafting at all. Um, or J.K. Rowling might have been involved in crafting. I highly doubt it. Um, but no, I don't think that. I, th- I I don't think they would have said. Oh, I don't think they would have transphobia. I don't think would be to have been the thing. They would have found something else to be mad about. Okay, so that so that leads us to um, the strange incident that happened with um, Emily Vanderwolf, um, mm-hmm. if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is a writer for Vox, and she and so Matthew Iglesias, uh, who is one of the co-founders of Vox. I think he's just like a editor there, senior editor or something. He, um, he signed, he signed the document and then she tweeted a screen cap of a, of a letter that she had sent to Vox human resources. She said she excised certain passages that only dealt with like internal stuff. So can't know what that is. And, uh, and it basically, she was saying that, uh, this made her feel unsafe. Did she use the word unsafe or? She said it made her feel less safe. She started out the letter saying, like, Matt has never been anything but kind to me, and he has promoted my work. And yet, she was felt, she was made to feel less safe. So she didn't say unsafe. Okay. Less safe. Less safe. So that's interesting. Okay, so, and, and, uh, this, this woman is trans. Um, and so this was very strange to me, uh, that you would, <laughs> that anyone would do this. What, what, did, yeah. what did you make of it? Oh, I thought it was insane. Um, I thought that, I also, like, she got so much heat for this that it was also ill-advised. Um, but to respond to a letter, to respond to a signature, a colleague's signature on what was pretty, a pretty milk toast defense of free speech, I thought it was well written, but this was not some, I don't know, um, some, like, fiery polemic. Um, by complaining to the manager is, to me, just illustrated the point of the letter, as did, so, you know, there's a follow-up letter. 
uh, with, I, I don't know how many people signed it, but this other letter was written in response to the letter. And uh, there were, I only heard of like five people on the letter, but like almost two dozen of them were anonymous uh, because apparently they feared retribution of their workplace, which to me is also hilarious and also indicative of the fact that there is clearly a problem with the culture of speech if you think that signing a letter for this is going to get you in trouble, which I honestly, like, I find it extremely hard to believe that anyone at the New York Times or NBC or anywhere would have gotten trouble at work for signing the second open letter. Um, you know, I didn't read the entirety of the second open letter because it I thought long. it was so vapid, um, but, yeah. and stupid, not, maybe not vapid is the wrong word. I thought it was stupid. And as I stated, there was a, a, a um, stylistic error in the first sentence that <laughs> often and annoys me. It was and the written. lies, yeah, the lies started in the second paragraph, paragraph, which Leighton Woodhouse pointed out on Twitter. I don't have the letter pulled up right now, but like literally there's like an introductory paragraph and the second paragraph just starts lying and then it just continues to lie throughout. Okay, and so one, so one paragraph is devoted to Jesse Single, one, one to J.B. Right. Rowling, but before we get to the second letter, still on the first, yeah. the first letter. First is there, letter. Has there been a third letter yet? I feel like there must have been. I'm crafting it now. It's just <laughs> a blank sheet of paper. It's just, it's just a dog whistle. That's it. <laughs> it's one of those things where like you trick someone into signing it and then you like take the sheet away and it's like yeah, actually they yeah. signed away their, their life rights yeah. or something. Um, yeah. so, okay, so what, okay, so, so, but my, my basic reaction to, okay, obviously there's something that's going on in the culture, um, that is bad, that involves speech, social media, online, and like controversial subjects. Right. Um, but what, like, but is the problem, like, lack of open debate? I mean, basically what I thought was, is the problem, uh, th- that speech is being constricted or is the problem that there's too much speech? Too many people have <laughs> the ability to speak and the ability to weigh in in a way that they didn't 30 years ago. And, um, and this is uh, not so. We think usually, like you know, everyone should have a vote. <laughs> Obviously, everyone should have their voice. Everyone has their own opinion, the right to their own opinion. Um, but you know, a lot of these opinions suck, and uh, there's no reason to that they should be shared. It doesn't do anything good for the world. It just uh, either do, you know is bad for the world, or uh, you know makes them feel good because they ex- they express something. So there's all sorts, you know, there's all sorts of crazy stuff on the internet. Um, you know, the QAnon, the uh, conspiracy theory that uh, is constantly roiling and, and is hasn't been justified in a single facet, but people believe it every time. You know, uh, fake news, whether from whether it came from, like, uh, Moldova or something, or just uh, uh, bored teenagers, uh, mm-hmm. you know, sending people uh, gifts of uh, their face being put into a uh, oven, uh, with a mm-hmm. you know, Nazi soldier outside. So there's all sorts of bad kinds of speech that have been enabled um, by the internet. And, you know, it was, it, in some ways, so the internet has enabled uh, some good things. You know, we're talking to each other over the internet from opposite sides of the country, uh, but also a number, number of bad things. And one bad thing is just uh, tons of random people out there can annoy other people online with basically no consequences and uh, and then go about go about their day. So... You know, like it, like online pylons. Maybe there's a couple people who are like in the media elite who participate or like set it off, but it's usually just normal people who like are joining in to yell someone or saying "die" or "I'm going to rape you" or, or "I want to stab you in the face." And um, how often do you see that on social media? Do you see "I want you to die," "I want to rape you," "I want to stab you in the face" on Twitter in particular? Well, I think it happens less than it used to. Um, mm-hmm. It happened a lot 2015, 2016. Um, mm-hmm. I had some kind of like run-ins, exact, not exactly, but like mixed it up with some alt-right people in during that era, and um, and so th- so that's where the you know I first saw the like get into the oven Jew kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, Twitter is such a poorly run website, but uh, you know when I when I go like look back to find an old tweet that had a word in it or something, and then I find these ones where I was, I was talking to someone who was an alt-right type person, they're all gone. So their accounts have been suspended or like that official suspended thing or just like it isn't there anymore. So they did do something where they took all these like anti-Semitic, uh, uh, pro-Trump alt-right trolls, either they just left or they banned them. And so Twitter is somewhat better than that, but then you, 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 so probably, so, okay. So most people are not really saying, I want to stab you in the face, but maybe they'll just be like, you know, this is a bad look or they'll like uh, right. add on like the, do uh, better. Some, some, like their employers at or something. If they're, if they're like in the media or something, or maybe even if not, or they'll, you know, just start like investigating, trying to figure out like who this person is in this video, that that, that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, you know, all these people think they're like pursuing the path of righteousness by tracking down you know, like some random person who was racist in a yeah. video or something, or was yelling about 
uh, about face masks or, or something like that. And then yeah. that person is found and get fired, or maybe they find someone who with a similar name or something. And that person's life is, uh, you know, ruined for 24 hours. So it's, so it's all a giant mess. And mm-hmm. <laughs> like, if, so I, I started to wonder whether, like, do we have a cancel culture problem or we just have like a Twitter culture problem? Like the things that happen on Twitter used to just stay there. Now they bleed yeah. over into real life. And some of those behaviors, I guess, maybe continue on like uh, the New York Times Slack channel or, or something like that. Um, but is it like, has there been like a change in consciousness or is it just that the technology has enabled people to behave in certain ways that is, uh, you know, bad for society as a whole? So what, what, what do you think of that? Yeah. I think both. I think, first of all, the ease at which people can join these um, pylons or maybe just, you know, shit out their criticism on the Internet, it's just gotten way easier, right? So if you wanted to, 10 or 15 years ago, if you had a problem with, you know, what a columnist wrote or something, you might, like, write a letter to the editor. Well, you don't do that anymore. You tweet them. Um, so there is this, you know, you have this more direct, direct access to people, um, which I personally hate. I wish that pe- people had less access to me at all times. I want like, ha- like if you're going to say something mean about me, I want it in a postcard um, <laughs> sent to a PO box, preferably not my house. Uh-huh. Um, so I think that's part of it. Just to ease it with, you know, it's partaking in some kind of pile on it it takes no effort it takes a second and then you just move on with your life whereas the target of it has can have sometimes career-ending consequences right so i think that's part of it i also think that we have entered a moment in which social justice or what we call social justice is sort of a meme right it's trendy like okay we're about the same age um you're from the northeast i'm from the southeast but when i was in high school the dominant culture was conservative the uh the sort of gatekeepers were just a lot more conservative especially like post 9 11 the zeitgeist was much more patriotic it was much more um i don't know it was more conservative and that has really changed and so the same people now like well, I, like i think about this a lot I think if you go to like any, like most high schools in America right now, the cool kids are probably less likely to be like the like dumb jocks who are not politically active or who uh, are who are like voted for Donald Trump or would vote for Donald Trump or whatever. And they're more likely to be, you know, people who post memes about social justice. So. I think that that's also a part of it is that social justice is incredibly trendy and maybe that's a good thing, right? Because it's better to social justice. I mean, it depends on what that word actually means, but you know, we want like, I'm a progressive. I want more progress. I want things to be more just, maybe less social, but more just. (laughs) Um, But what you have is this, is this culture where a lot of the activism is totally performative. It's narcissistic. You post a meme and then you don't do anything about it, right? This isn't backed up by any sort of like real commitment to the ideology, or maybe it is backed up by some kind of commitment to the ideology, but I just think it's just incredibly trendy right now, while also at the same time giving people the feeling that they are on the right side of history, right? Um, I think especially like post Trump election, there is a lot of terror about the ushering of the ushering in of authoritarianism under Trump. He has thankfully proved too comp- incompetent to be an authoritarian. I think. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Even he might he might try. I think I see the authoritarian creeping in from the bottom, which is in some ways scarier, um, because it's our peers, not you know the not you know not the state. So I think part of it also like a genuine desire to be on what people see as the right side of history combined with social media and just the trend. Uh, you know, it's, it's cool to be a, to be a, a, a like an activist or a social media just, justice activist as, uh-huh. as I, as I call it. Um, yeah. So all of that I think has, has led to where we are now and I don't really know where it's going to go. Uh-huh. No, we're good. Um, so what, what you described about uh, the high schools is actually kind of well, one of the plot points in um, the 21 jump street. Uh, mm. remake. Did you did you see that? I haven't. No. You should check it out because it's basically like yeah. okay, you had Jonah Hill and uh, oh god, what was the guy's name? The guy who was in Magic Mike. Um, yeah. The dancer. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, who, so Ch- what's his Channing name? Channing Tatum. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Who, you know, who's just like, who looks like this big jock guy. And, uh, and so they go undercover as high school students, uh, they're police officers, they go undercover as high school students, and they're thinking that the Jonah Hill character, this is when he was still more chubby, um, you know, he's gonna be the nerd, and Channing Channing yeah. will be like the jock, and then it yeah. turns out that, uh, you know, they, they, they like fake a fight, um, to sort of like, uh, insinuate themselves into, uh, with the other students, and the kids all like start, going after Channing Tatum, being like, hey man, bullying's not cool. And, and <laughs> yeah, there, I think yeah. there's even a line where, where the Channing Tatum character says, like, you know, like, bullying isn't cool anymore. I can't believe it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, but it is, but it is, but but bullying is cool. It's just <laughs> bullying different people. A di- yeah, a different, a, different, a different kind of bullying. Um, okay, so, yeah, I don't... Okay, so where, where should we go with this? So I think, like, the... Okay, so, th- so there was this... Okay, so massive reaction... And then, and then a counter reaction. And as you said, this, the, so, I mean, the, the, the reply was often like, who are these, you know, entitled people, these privileged people, um, to, uh, sound off on this. And I think Phoebe, uh, Malsbovi wrote a piece that is a pretty effective counter argument to that, which is basically like, you know, the, the people who are, who are in the, a lower position in any sort of hierarchy are, you know, they can't speak out. So right. uh, it, it takes the people who are more towards the top uh, to speak out on their behalf. Um, right. And then right. there, yeah, and, uh, there was just a lot of like, you know, check your privilege kind of thing. These people are all rich. Um, yeah, I, that, that was my favorite line. These people are all rich. Mm-hmm. And, and Phoebe yeah. on, on Twitter was making some amusing um, jokes about that saying like, you know, I have to get my, well, I have a, one and a half year old toddler and she just threw up on the dog and I need to clean it up or something like that. Yeah. So uh, th- like no one, no one is doing this for me. Um, but yeah, so those are, those were kind of the predicted moves and then, okay. But then you, okay. So the counter letter, I, I didn't read the entire thing, but it, it did seem to be like, it was more going after the people than going after the, uh, stated ideals. And right. one was, one was Jesse. And we, we actually, I think the last time we talked, we, we talked about Jesse's article that was in the, um, the cover of the Atlantic uh, about, uh, tr- uh, you know, like, tra- like transitioning among teenagers, if I, if I recall, and it was very, yeah, very gender use dysphoria, gender use dysphoria, yeah. And, you use, know, use gender dysphoria, that actually is what it is. Yes. Um, so, uh, okay, so yeah, so what, what did you, what did you think of the, of counter letter, you know, open letter number two, the counter letter? I thought it was really funny. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think it made many coherent arguments, um, you know, the, the, there's a couple points that this sort of, I don't know what to call them, the anti-free speech brigade, they would never call themselves that, but there's a couple points they bring up over and over. One, freedom of speech does not mean freedom of consequences. I, I want to trademark that phrase, and every time somebody tweets it, they have to give me money. <laughs> they have to ask my permission for it. It's okay. become such a platitude. Um, and the other is that, you know, what's happening now is just... This isn't about a, the Harper's letter was about sort of what we're seeing is this constricting of liberal values, right? The Overton, the Overton window is narrowing to a point where mainstream accepted thought is now considered hate speech, is now considered too problematic to publish or whatever. Um, and there are real consequences to this. You know, Megan McArdle uh, had a great thread yesterday about, um, about cancel culture, which I, I highly recommend people look up. She, and she said that, you know, one of the problems with this is that there are sort of these acceptable narratives. And you can't, if you're a scientist, you can't research something that the conclu- like that you, where you don't already know the conclusion and the conclusion doesn't fit into this acceptable narrative. And the same things are happening in media and tech and business all over the place. And I think that's, that's real. There's a stifling effect, not just on, on expression, but on thought. I'm deeply concerned about that. Um, but so the other thing, people say is, you know, this isn't, this isn't cancel culture. This is just minorities, uh, marginalized groups, the oppressed all of a sudden have a platform. And this is just, you know, you're just being criticized by people who have never had the access to, to criticize you before. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know that I have a response to that other than I just, I don't think that's true. I don't think that the issue is that people are talking about Black Lives Matter or, or, or uh, putting their perspective, like, I think it's great that the New York Times wants to post columns about abolishing the cops or whatever. But I think if they're going to publish columns about abolishing the police, they also need to publish columns from the conservative perspective. So to me, the problem is not that marginalized groups all of a sudden have this newfound ability to be heard. It's that the effect of that is shutting down, not the effect of that, but the the effect of the stifling of, of discourse is that it's shutting down everybody else. Not, not, and I don't, that makes it seem like I'm talking like marginalized groups versus everybody else. I'm not saying that. Anybody who has, uh, an opinion that might be slightly out of the, the current pers- or accepted progressive thought feels stifled. Not everybody, but I get tons of emails every day from people who are in academia or tech or whatever sort of fields in media who just say like, I'm terrified of my colleagues. I'm terrified that I'm going to be denounced uh, denounced for wrong speak if I do things like say that I like your podcast. You know, I have had so many people say that they've had friendships in because they shared an article of mine on Facebook. Oh boy! So yes, I'm, so yes. I'm really I'm risk, I'm taking my life in my hands uh, just yeah. by inviting you onto, yeah. the, onto my Very, show. So I hope you don't feel too unsafe. <laughs> Ah, I'm feeling okay right now. We'll see. We'll see. Check in. Yeah. We'll check in. You know, in 48 hours or so. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, I've, I've, I actually, uh, you know, yeah, it, it does seem there's like almost this uh, contagion kind of idea that yes. like you know someone someone who is the wrong type of person like infects you and then you. I mean, we're li- we're living through it, a literal contagion right now. But the the metaphorical contagion of the bat of the evil ideas. Um, the real pandemic is counterculture. <laughs> I mean, it's cancel culture. <laughs> um. <laughs> So, okay, well, I, I, I mean, something I did think is that getting back to this idea about, like, is our problem uh, constriction of speech or, like, too much speech, you know, there's really, so, so everyone really agrees on some limits on speech. So sure. there, there's the classic um, shouting fire in a crowded theater that, you know, some jurist came up with, like, 100 years ago. Um, there's one that I've thought of that I don't see anyone mention is, like, you know, uh, sh- should I be allowed to um, be on the sidewalk outside your house with a loudspeaker at 4 a.m., like, you know, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance or something? Like, no, like, you, the people in the house would call the police and they would arrest right. me for some sort of, like, misdemeanor or something. So there's, right. so the, the unfettered yeah. free speech doesn't truly exist. Um, no. it, it, even, like, someone yelling on the street corner might, some authority figure might tell them they need to stop or something. Um, right. And so it really is, like, a matter of like a matter of degrees. Like once we, once we can see that there, it's not just like you can say whatever you want and the state can't do it. You know, state can't do anything about it. Where there's a couple of examples where the state does something and then the obvious things about, you know, you have to suffer the consequences of, of the thing you say, which you say has become a, a total cliche, but like it is, it's a cliche because it's true. Like if I say something, uh, you know, if I start um, using uh, racial slurs or something right now, uh, then, and this is posted online, then I might lose my job. And right. and that would have been the case like thirty years ago, probably also if, if it depends on where you work, but yeah. Yeah, so if someone, you know, had like secretly kept recorded a white person uh using the N word uh in nineteen ninety and then it was leaked to the press because it's a politician but, or something, they they would have got in trouble. Okay, except okay, so yes, if you're using the in your N word as a slur, if you're directing it towards somebody. But now we've had sort of the opposite thing where any sort of like saying saying the N word as a quote, reciting a, you know, this is what this person said. Here's the name of a play. There are plays that have the N word in it using the soft N word, which I mean, the soft N word was not actually problematic until very recently. Even printing the word, the the hard the hard R N word was not problematic until very recently, which I know because I searched for it in the archives of the New York Times mm-hmm. recently, and it is still actually being printed in the New York Times. It was printed in the New York Times a couple of couple of weeks ago. Probably so quotes, that, right? Uh, it was the name of a play, yeah. But okay. in other contexts, you're not allowed to say it. Like a woman just got fired from the CBC for saying it. She mm. wasn't saying it directed at anybody. She was saying it uh, in the. She was quoting somebody or something like that. Right. Yeah, I, I mean so, the, the the N word is this weird thing that is so like historically fraught that actually long ago, like a ten or so years ago, we had we had someone on with I think McWhorter was was the counterpart on Blogging Heads. He had written a book that is called the Word, uh, mm-hmm. like the history of a troublesome phrase or word or something. And, and so, like, I was the one, you know, typing this into WordPress or whatever, so I was, I was typing it out, not something I usually do, but also, like, you know, the, 
generally the New York Times doesn't print the word fuck. Um, there was this play right. called the, the Motherfucker in the Hat or something, or the Motherfucker with the Hat. That was, I think Chris Rock was in it. It was about eight or so years ago. And they would just print it as like dash, dash, dash with a hat, uh, when, mm-hmm. in, you know, in, in the reviews over and over again. So there's this low, you know, different levels of decorum in different things mm-hmm. where it's, you know, basically on a podcast saying motherfucker, no one cares at this, right. at this point in 2020. We have worse things, but yeah, the N word is, is held off in this weird, weird different space. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, I saw, I saw an article recently that um, it was about a, a nurse who got fired from her job at the university of Louisiana um, for using racial slurs online. And uh, they obscured the word monkey. She called Obama a monkey uh-huh. and they obscured the word monkey. So it was like M dash, dash, dash Y. So you also had to sort of figure it out. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what I would have. I don't, I don't think I would have jumped a monkey in that in that case. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean the the you know words the, the like you know uh, Carlin's uh, se- seven W yeah, words. Yeah, seven words. Say, like some yeah. of these. Like one of them was tits. Like uh, like people say right. tits all the time now. So so these things change right. and um and and mores evolve and yes yeah, so now there's like the F slur. Uh, which you see people both like joking about well, online and maybe being serious yeah. about online. And I mean, uh, someone, uh, what's his name? Ben Howe or Ben Howie. I think it's Ben Howe just got fired today from the Lincoln project for, he like called people a twat on social media and he was fired for that. Like years ago, called them a twat. Right. Okay. So they're digging through, they're digging through the old uh, archives. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's funny because the Lincoln project or whatever it's called is this group of like anti-Trump Republicans who are like using mm-hmm. the, um, the dark arts they've learned attacking Democrats for many years to create like these commercials that seem to be more, you know, are, are much sharper right. than the standard kind of commercials right. Democrats would make with their against Trump and other Republicans. Um, but I don't know. I'm not exactly shedding a tear for that particular guy, but, but yes, right. okay, but, but again, it's kind of, it does all get back to like, so if, okay. So this guy who tweeted, he tweeted twat at someone in 2012 or whatever, mm-hmm. um, you know, he probably wouldn't have like in an interoffice memo have put the word twat, or even like right. an email or a fax or something. Like it, it's the fact that this weird, there's this weird. Uh, yeah. If you work at a gynecologist, it's fine. There, called Twitter in which it's very easy to call someone a twat. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this here that um, I started saying, okay, so at some point in the past three or four months, Ted Cruz tweeted something and I tweeted, it, or I tweeted at him something like, shut the fuck up, motherfucker. And I was immediately put in a 12 hour timeout by Twitter. It was like, for, for saying that to Ted Cruz? Yes. What should be See, my that, right as an American? To yes! Tell, that should be your... You should be able to tell anybody in elected office to shut the fuck up, motherfucker. So, but it was like... It was literally instantaneous after I hit send. So wow. So clearly they had programmed it that so many people were telling Ted Cruz to shut the fuck up. Um, so then I started, as a joke, uh, instead of saying, if I see some, some asshole conservative on Twitter, instead of saying, shut the fuck up, I say, uh, eat a turd dingus. Um... <laughs> In part because I think dingus is a funny word that should be brought back yeah. as an insult. So You know, that's also, like, a much worse. Like, eat a turd is way, way more graphic than shut the fuck up. Right. Um, but, you know, turd is, is you know, I, I, I think the New York Times would print the word turd, and I'm sure they would print the word dingus. Uh, but then someone, some guy who is, like, a sociologist, like, an actual professor, like, found one of my replies in which I said, eat a turd dingus to someone on Twitter, and started like going off about it and tagged the uh, blogging heads um, Twitter uh, Twitter account as like Did a way run to, that? as a way to get me in trouble. I also I run that account, so <laughs> I didn't get in trouble that time. But um, and then and then I ended up like I was like, I hope you what? responded from the blogging heads Twitter not, account to I, him I, I, and I said, it, "Eat a turd dingus." I kept it professional, but I think I I was like, "What should I do about this?" I was like, you know, I'll probably just ignore. It. But then I think he followed it up or something, and then. I did tweet at him, eat a turd dingus and, and blocked him. But then like, you know, whenever he blocks someone, it gives them some content. So then he was like, why, why did this guy block me? Like, you know, and then other people were kind of like looking through my old tweets to see all the other people I said, eat, eat a turd dingus to, because I do it semi regularly, at least. So that was, that was the closest I've ever come to some sort of like quasi cancellation. It didn't work. But, um, but even say, you know, even say this guy was trying to get me in trouble. Um, and and straight he followed me, um, on Twitter beforehand. That's how we found the tweet. I, uh, though we, we never drafted. So I don't know exactly what his motivations were. And then, um, uh, so I'm, I'm fine. I survived the Edith Dingus cancellation attempt. And I continue to say Edith Dingus, which I think is a good thing to say that won't get you in trouble on Twitter, but still maybe indicates go fuck yourself <laughs> to someone. Right. So this, so this is that kind of thing. It's just like the light, the language I use, the guy, the guy said twat, which is like somewhere between, I don't even know, a dirty word and a, yeah, curse kind of but like probably yeah. 
if you said it in middle school, maybe you'll get one day of detention or something. Um, but like, yeah, usually a, a adults are not t- saying twat to each other, like unless they're cutting each other off in traffic or something. And it's just, it is weird that this guy is an adult. And it just like this, this platform encourages juvenile behavior as far as, is part of the problem. You know, I, I wasn't calling people dingus, uh, before I was on Twitter, I don't think. So I don't know where yeah. I'm going with this, but it is, I, I think I, I continue to think like a lot of the problem just is a strange website that was meant to send like text messages to other people, yeah. um, yeah. you know, without incurring data charges yeah. or whatever, or, or texting charges, and then somehow took over uh, media and politics, and, you know, the, and the president uses it multiple times a day, so that's strange. Right. Um, do you, okay, do you think if if social media, I actually asked a similar question, an episode that'll probably air after this, that I taped with Lee Stein, who you did a, mm. a um, you did a, an, an online event with recently, but do you think if, like, so, you know, God snapped his or her fingers and social media disappeared, all of it, uh, like the internet infrastructure was still there, but Facebook, Twitter, Instagram was all gone. What would happen to all these problems? Would they just reform in some other way or, or, or would it be better? That's a really good question. Um, I think that these problems would probably go away, but other problems would arise. You know, there are things that are good about social media. Um, it's been good for, Black Lives Matter for for the growth of movements. It's been the, gr- the good for the growth of my career personally. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that cancel culture, yeah, I think that, or what we call cancel culture right now, and this is not a new phenomenon. What's new about it is social media and the ease at which, and the consequences, the ease at which you can ruin someone's career with a click. Um, if people can do that, I think I think that would go away. If they didn't have anywhere to share their videos of the racist incident or the or the you know the fifteen year old tweet that a twelve year old made, I think it would go away. Um, but there would be some downsides to that too. On the whole, I think probably the world would be a better place. But I mean, I, uh, you know, what would Donald Trump do with his time? He might focus on policy, and I don't know if that would be good or bad. Uh, yeah, he might spend more time with his family. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting. And then you, when you think like, what would ha- like, this is, you know, should Twitter ban Trump has been a running issue, um, yeah, for, for years. Uh, and then, but if they just, if they ban him, like, you know, he has, like, he could use a website, like, he, like, he could post right. the same exact messages. They could he the could system. start a vlog or yeah, a podcast. So start, yeah, maybe a podcast. And then, you know, depending on how the election comes out, maybe he will start a blog and a podcast or a TV show <laughs> or a TV network. Um, he's, he's much more a media figure than a political figure, re- really. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I, I think, like, if he, yeah, it's it just, it's just strange that he, you know, if, if he posted, if, instead of using Twitter, he had used Facebook, like, it just would have been different because the media elite spend their time on Twitter, and so on they Twitter. see messages, and they see the interactions, and they see how popular or unpopular any relative message is, and, um, and so I guess uh, Trump was either canny or just lucky that this is, mm-hmm. you know, he used, he got into Twitter very early instead of getting into Instagram or Facebook or um, Snapchat. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Well, let me see if I have anything else that I wanted to ask. Um, oh, well, I, I guess, I guess let me just run this by you. So I, I, I tweeted a couple days ago that like, you know, there's people who think cancel culture doesn't even exist, but the, the, the term seems not well suited to whatever reality we're experiencing because it seems mm-hmm. like there's, diff- there's kind of different parts to it. Um, right. so, so there's like, there's the viral videos and then people, you know, attacking someone who get ca- gets caught in a viral video. There's the work, work workplace aspect and then people being, you know, all, all the, the millennials are in charge of the workplace now and it, and everything is too woke and you can't say anything bad or whatever. And then there's just the, you know, the online like censoriousness and sort of like the moralizing that uh, Twitter encourages like strong, like if you tweet something that's like a strong moral statement, it's more likely to get likes and retweets and something that's like, you know, bl- uh, like bland and, and somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. That's that's how the the that's what the system rewards. Um, and you know, so what are the, like what are the things we could possibly change? And what are what are the parts that are just yeah? You know, this is our world now. So er- so everyone's going to have a camera, a video camera in their pockets. Yeah, seemingly forever going forward. Uh, so you could anytime there's some person who's an asshole or having a bad day or whatever, um, someone could capture it. Uh, but sort of the like censoriousness and the like, this is a bad look and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff seems like it is more cultural and maybe that could change with the times or something, or if there's some technological change that could shift. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any thoughts on this? I do think that there, you know, 
Twitter's not going to do this because Twitter has no incentive for this because I think ultimately this is good for their platform. All of this, all of this is good for their platform. As bad as it is for the, for the world, I think it's good for Twitter. Um, but I think there's some technological fixes. Like they could take away the ability to retweet. They could take abil- away the ability to quote tweet. That would mean that tweets wouldn't go viral, but you would have to engage in conversation with someone directly instead of just purely dunk on them. And, and also like when you quote tweet someone, You know, it takes the conversation out of their sort of zone, out of their home court, and puts it into your home court, where all of a sudden the, uh, the, it's like changing teams all of a sudden. All of a sudden you're, you're on, you're in hostile territory. Uh Um, you know, and I do the same thing. Like, it's a lot easier to quote tweet someone and where I know like my followers, my army of, of reply guys and gals and assorted non binary identities, um, will probably agree with me. And going to someone directly and saying, like, uh, I think you're full of shit and here's why. I mean, obviously, lots of people do that. Um, but, you know, just uh, like as a human being, if you engage with someone directly in conversation, I think you're less likely to be an asshole. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think Twitter's going to do that, but they could. Yeah, I mean, th- there's Twitter put out something in the past year or so that was like, Twitter is a place for conversations or something like that. It's almost like they don't, like, does anyone at Twitter HQ actually use Twitter? Like, it is not, (laughs) it's not for conversations. It's it's for like, rah, rah, my side is good. Your side is bad. Yeah, dunking, you know. Maybe they're just on a different, maybe like we're in our echo chamber in our, like, in media Twitter, Twitter is one thing. And then tech Twitter is very friendly. No fighting, just conversation. Well, I kind of got it. I mean, if you, do you ever, I often am bored and I will just click on a trending topic and kind of see what, like, Mm. somewhat normal people are, how they use Twitter. And it's a lot of ridiculous shit. It's usually like, uh, you know, someone on a Real Housewives show did something or, like, you know, an actor broke up with so on and so forth Mm -hmm. or some sports thing happened and people are, they're they're using the same sort of exaggeration of emotion and, you know, like, like run me over with a car, you know, I I'm dying a thousand times. Like, cause that's uh, within every little mini world on Twitter. It's like the same rules of exaggeration and emotion and outrageousness. You you, know, I think that's true of just online subcultures. Like last year I wrote a story about um, my I think it's called My Favorite Murder, which is a podcast, oh, yeah, yeah. a super, super popular, like, true crime podcast. And when I started working on this piece, everybody I talked to was like, this is the most positive online community. There's no drama. By the time I finished working on this piece, the the women who make the show had made the mistake of putting a picture of a teepee in one of their, their like, swag, like a shirt or whatever. And that was problematic. Just the picture of a teepee. Uh-huh. Um, because cultural appropriation or what the fuck ever. Uh So by the time I finished reporting the piece, the whole thing had dissolved. I mean, they still have their fandom, but like they had this, they had like Facebook groups with hundreds of thousands of followers and they'd shut them all down because, because this over the course of weeks, like there had just been something and you, you know, you go look at that with any subculture, any sort of fandom. And I think a lot of this is very reminiscent of fandom. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like, Knitting Twitter, knitting Instagram, they have their crazy, crazy their bullshit. Dramas, yeah. And oftentimes, this sort of the catalyst is some sort of social justice issue. Yeah, I think that um, I, maybe I've, I've either said this on the show before or maybe just tweeted it that, like, yeah, all, maybe all online communities like tend towards toxicity over time because they're just so, some sort of psychological um, dynamic that develops where, like, there, there's people who you know, they're, they all have some uniting interest or something in knitting or, you know, the Supergirl t- or Superwoman mm-hmm. TV show on the CW or something. And then the people who are more on the extremes in whatever way um, start pulling everyone, like, towards them. And then there's, like, a backlash and people are, are going right. after each other. And, um, and, and all the other, um, you know, the fact that people don't see their real faces and et cetera, et cetera, all these other things make it more likely that people are you know, acting right. like total jerks to each other, um, right. no matter, no matter what the, what the topic is. So yeah, it may right. be, um, yeah, it does, it does seem to be somewhat intrinsic to, uh, online communities. Um, at least uh, ones that are may- heterogeneous. I mean, or, maybe sorry, it's, homogenous. yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe that's, maybe it's not even just online. Maybe this is just sort of the nature of, of communities. Um, you know, yeah, specifically ones that tend to be homogenous. Um, right. But I mean, but, but like being in a room with someone is very different than being on a message board with them totally. and, and you see them and, totally. and now we're in this weird place where you can't even, yeah. if you have a local knitting club, you can't all get together um, at the library on Sunday afternoons because right. of the pandemic. So, so even more of life has shifted over mm-hmm. into the digital realm where 
the uh, the like signals that people use to like accept each other's humanity are no yeah. longer are no longer in effect. Um, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, but except for here on Blogging Heads, where we're uh, we get, we're looking at each other's faces and um, are treating each other as full and equal humans and citizens as res- respectfully as humanly possible. Yes. Okay. I think we've got a bit over an hour. Um, is there anything else you you want to say uh, before we wrap up? Eat a turd, dingus. <laughs> maybe that should be the t- maybe that should be the title of the episode. Although that yeah. that could probably put off some potential viewers. You and might listeners. have yeah. You might have some uh, some SEO problems with that. <laughs> right. You get um, shadow banned. <laughs> so okay. So so thank you, Katie, for coming on. Yeah. I hope I hope I'm not canceled via association <laughs> with you. Um, and 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 thanks for uh, sharing your opinion. And uh, and so uh, block reported uh, on on you know iTunes or, or what a podcast app or whatever. You yeah, can whatever. find it everywhere. There's also a Patreon uh, for bonus episodes and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, anything else you wanna you wanna plug before we wrap up? No, this is all I'm Twitter? doing now. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter if you want. Look me up. I'm easy to find. You this is all I'm great, doing now. You have one of the great what? Twitter handles. Oh, Kitty Perzog. Yeah, Kitty Perzog. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I have nothing to plug because I'm not doing anything anymore. I'm basically semi-retired, um, which I have to say, I recommend it. I went to like I went to uh, to like play disc golf with my dog today. I'm gonna go pick some blackberries in the backyard later. Wow. Um, that does I basically nice. work like one and a half days a week. <laughs> that's yeah. That's that's. I mean, that's great. Congratulations. And at least, Thank so, you. like you said, your your podcast is 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 going gangbusters, and you've had a lot of um, paid subscribers who are who are eager to um, support the work that you and Jesse are doing, uh, which yeah. is, which I think is a good thing, even if you are, you know, uh, canceled at some point mm-hmm. or, uh, I, I'll, I will fully, sure. I guess you've been, can- you've been canceled multiple times before. Um, you can only be canceled so many times and then you get the antibodies and then you can't be canceled anymore. Yeah, there is kind of an immunity that one, you know, if, if you just don't give in to the mob or something, yeah, it's kind of like you, you do like, I know, they, they focus on someone else or something to, to, well, to it, go after. Yeah. I mean, it does depend on on who you are, on what your position is. I think things are different if you're, you know, you work at the local Walmart and a video gets released of you doing something bad or whatever mm-hmm. um, than if you are, you know, somebody with a lot of Twitter followers. Um, but yeah, we're in a good position. Um, it's good to talk to you. Uh, good to talk to you, too. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers and listeners, and we'll see you next time.